Uh, well, it's lovely to be here and it's lovely to see so many of you this evening. And yes, e exactly, really, this is what um, Vertical Veg is all about. It's about trying to support and inspire people who don't have gardens to grow food. And I think one of the sort of main things I've been trying to share with people is that well, one of the wonderful things about continuing is you can do it on any scale. You can just have a couple of pots of herbs and that you can get a lot out of that. Um, but equally, uh, it is possible to create a really meaningful and productive garden uh, in a small space uh, like a balcony. And that was a big surprise to me because when I started, I thought I would just get you know, the odd pot of rocket here or there. And I never really thought that we could actually get a lot of food to, to eat. Um, anyway, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to talk for about sort of 40 minutes and then I'll come back in and we'll have a good um, some uh, questions. Um, so here we are. Um, yeah, so it's all about the work I do is all about creating beautiful and productive and wildlife friendly container gardens. Um, and all the other uh, benefits. Um, tonight we're going to focus on really how to grow. Um, it's sort of an overview. Um, I mean, there's, I think my book is 300 pages long and a lot of that is all about how to grow. But the thing about growing is it can be, it can be happen on all sorts of different levels. And I think a little bit of information can often make a really big difference. So my aim tonight really is to give you those little bits of information that will make the biggest difference. And sometimes those little bits of different information actually make the difference between uh, not being successful and being and being successful. So that's really my aim tonight. Um, so I'm gonna look at um, the steps to success and I'm gonna give you a few ideas. Again, there's hundreds of things you can grow. You can almost grow anything in a container. I'm gonna give you a few ideas of some of the best things and some of the easiest things. And then I'm gonna finish with uh, just some tips for uh, really abundant crops and really healthy crops uh, in in containers um so yes this is where i lived in london i had a balcony i couldn't get an allotment i waited for five years uh and i found out it was going to be another 30 years so i thought i'd try growing with very low expectations just about 12 years ago but when i did start growing i quickly discovered that i could actually grow like a really like a lot of food and that's when seeing all the empty spaces in London that could be growing food, that's when I started vertical veg. Um, this is what I grew in a year. Um, I measured it one year, uh, 83 kilos. So this was on the balcony you just saw, plus the windowsills on the other side. Um, and uh, it's so valuable, nearly 900 pounds, partly because I grew a lot of herbs, which are expensive and also a lot of salad. So we had the equivalent of 144 packs of salad uh, so pretty much for eating something nearly every day and sometimes quite significant amount of food every day from, from a balcony and windowsills. This is where I then moved up to Newcastle Tyne about 10 years ago and our house, this is the front yard, this is typical of many houses here and sometimes you get whole streets like this and it's pretty bleak to be honest. Um, but uh, when you put some plants in it sort of changes the feel of it a bit and the street a bit and uh, adds colour and get the bees there and everything. Um, so let's look at some steps to uh, success. So the first one is that a lot of urban spaces uh, don't have full sun. So most crops, as you probably be aware, do grow best uh, in full sun, which is at least half an hour, half a half a day, uh, so at least six hours or more uh, sun a day. Um, so, but many urban spaces don't actually get that much sun. A lot of them get quite a lot less. So it's important when you start growing that you know what you can, know how much sun your space gets and what you can grow in your space according to how much sun it has. So, as I said, if you have full sun, so lots of sun, all these all, pretty much all these crops in this picture, you'll be able to grow fine. Um, however, if you have less sun than that, um, so for example, if you only have three or four hours sun, 
then you really need to focus. There's still a lot you can grow. You just have to choose more carefully. But all the leafy things, so that's pretty much all the herbs, even the herbs that the Mediterranean herbs that are often described as needing full sun, will actually grow fine in three or four hours sun. They won't develop quite as much flavour, but they'll still be fine. Um, all the salad leaves, and then all things like chard and kale and spinach, um, and then also all the woodland fruits. So that's things like blueberries and raspberries, Chilean guavas, uh, red currants, black currants, uh, and rhubarb are also good choices. With a bit more sun, um, that's about half a day sun, pretty much all the root crops will do okay, uh, and peas and beans. And then the things which really need a plenty of sun are the subtropical uh, Mediterranean fruits like tomatoes, chilies, aubergines, and also some fruits. So actually hardy kiwis grow well in the UK, but they do need full sun, peaches and apricots. Uh, and the thing about a lot of small spaces is that sometimes uh, the sun, there can be a complex pattern of sun. So you need to work out which bits have the most sun and which bits have the least, and then put those sun loving crops in the sunniest spaces and the less ones. So for example, uh, this is my balcony here. And um, down this bit here, if you can see that pen, this bit got was the only bit that got more than six hours sun a day. So there I've got a courgette and a tomato plant. This bit back here and here got about half a day sun. So that's why I've got a runner bean. And I've also got some potatoes there that you can't see. So that's root crops and beans do well in half a day sun. And then at the beginning, yeah, four, and that's where um, I um, grew uh, salad leaves. Uh, now, if I can clear. Uh, so that was the north, that balcony you just saw was north facing, so it didn't, wasn't hugely sunny, but the, the windowsills on the other side were sunny, and this is what I grew on those windowsills, so all the sun-loving things uh, did well there, so I was lucky to have those two spaces. Um, the next thing is the size of pot that you use, and I, I always like to include this, it sort of seems obvious in some ways, but there's a lot of stuff on the internet on Pinterest and things with people growing food in yogurt pots, small yogurt pots. And the thing is, it is quite possible to do that, but it, it's just more difficult because the smaller the pot is, the harder the plant is to, the more stressed the plant is going to get because it doesn't, it's not going to have very much water, it doesn't have very much food, and it can't develop a very big root system. Um, so it just need, they just need watering more often as well. So it's quite possible to grow in those small pots. And, you know, it's a fun thing to do with kids. But if you want to grow food um, sort of a bit more seriously, then it's easier to grow in bigger, in bigger pots. Um, so here is an example. This is a mint from a supermarket. And the reason why supermarket herbs don't last very long is that the pots are very small. If you put mint into a bigger pot like this, um, this is a supermarket mint pint in a bigger pot, uh, it will grow much bigger and if you chop that mint plant up every year and replant it, uh, that will last you for the rest of your life. I mean this one's about 10 years old, uh, so it will just keep going um, for forever. Um, the size of the pot you need is related a bit to the size of the plant that you want to harvest. So when you're growing microgreens, of course, you don't need a big pot for that because you're just growing small baby leaves. So these are just um, mushroom trays, recycled mushroom trays. So they are doing fine um, in that size of pot. But if you want to grow a big crop, so this is a tromba squash, which is a really fun thing to grow. Um, the baby ones taste like courgettes. The big ones uh, are more squash-like, uh, still good. Um, but you need a, probably at least a 30 litre container to grow something. So the bigger the fruit you want, uh, the bigger the container you're going to need to grow it in. Probably 50 litres would be um, better. And the same for uh, fruit trees. 
So you can actually grow an apple in a 20 or 30 litre container, but as they get bigger, get older, um, you can keep them in smaller um, pots if you haven't got space, but if you've got space for one, but this is about the apple I'm uh, mulching here is about 80 litres. Um, and that gives 100 apples a year, um, but I wouldn't be able to get 100 apples off it if it was in a in a much smaller pot. I'd probably get 20 or 30, which would still be lovely. 20 or 30 apples would still be really nice, but if it's possible to put it in a bigger pot, you will get a bigger crop. So um, step three is compost. And this is one of the hardest aspects, I think, when if you haven't grown before, to sort of understand because the thing is that compost looks quite similar or it's quite difficult to see it when it's in bags in the shop. Um, but the important thing to know is that it is the foundations of growing and how well things grow will depend really a lot on how good the compost is. And the other thing to know about it is that it is a variable and inconsistent product. <laughs> so there is very good compost uh, which plants grow extremely well in, and there is very bad compost, which plants can hardly grow at all in. And one of the main things is that some of the, if you go to a, to a, a supermarket store or something and buy their compost, uh, it can be good. But the thing you need to be aware of is that the main thing about it, if the cheap stuff, is it's more inconsistent. So the risk is just more risk, but it won't be good. Um, and if you're starting off, um, it's really disappointing if things don't grow very well and often people don't realise, but it's just because the compost they bought is not particularly good quality. So it's really worth um, getting a good compost if you can. So these um, two plants here, tomatoes, uh, one is in a, a, a budget compost and one in is in a, in, a, in a brand called Silver Grow. And hopefully you can see the difference. The Silver Grow plant looks much stronger, greener, and uh, the uh, supermarket one uh, is going yellow, which is a sign it hasn't really got enough food. Now, as I say, don't, I'm not trying to say don't buy budget supermarket stuff because it can sometimes be good. What I am saying is that um, try it and don't buy lots of it <laughs> until you've tried it. And also if things aren't growing well, um, whatever compost you've bought, even, even the sort of best brands, occasionally you can get a bad batch. So just be aware that it does make a difference. And if things aren't growing well, it often uh, is um, often is, is the compost. So two good brands to mention are Silver Grow, which I just mentioned now, and also another one called Fertile Fibre. And it's very important to buy peat free as well. Um, I'm sure many of you know that, but just to, to reiterate. And shops now are generally getting better at labeling it peat free but not always so and unless it says peat free actively says it on the bag it probably isn't <laughs> that's my experience anyway so, so do make sure uh, you buy peat free compost so step four is checking that the pot has good drainage and this is important because the roots of the plants need air to breathe and so if the pot isn't draining well and it gets filled up with water all the air holes will be uh, blocked up in the all the air holes in the soil will fill up with water and the plant plant will effectively uh, drown now this luckily is quite an easy one to make sure if you have a good quality compost it should drain well so really all you need to do is make sure there's some good holes in the bottom of the pot and then normally the water will drain out fine but occasionally if your pot is on a flat surface the actual the surface can actually block the holes in the pot so sometimes a this bit like in this picture here it's a good idea to raise the pot on feet so that the water can actually drain out um, the other thing to be aware of and that can sometimes happen when you have drainage holes is that water can go up drainage holes as well as down them <laughs> So if you have your pot sitting somewhere in a puddle, what will happen, if, if particularly if it's in a puddle over a long period of time, is that water will go up the pot, up the holes, and waterlog the compost. So try to make sure um, 
putting your putting your so that's a that's something to be wary about actually so putting a plant in a saucer of water is a great way to give it water for an hour but don't leave it in there for sort of you know a couple of days because the soil will get waterlogged and the plant will uh, will struggle um, the next uh, step is to space your crops for the best harvest for optimal harvests and this really depends on what, how far you space them depends on what you want. So, and it also depends on leafy veg and root veg and fruit fruits. So for leafy veg, um, if you sow seeds very close together like this, uh, you'll get small leaves and you'll get actually a lot of leaves very quickly. So this is a really good way for getting a really quick harvest and actually quite a high yield um, from a very very small space so if you want to grow a lot in a very small space this is a very very effective strategy the only thing about this way of growing is that because the plants are very close together they very quickly use up the nutrients and they start competing with each other and quite quickly they will run out of steam and so you won't be able to harvest that uh, that container for that long so if you plant them a little bit further apart, say about one centimetre apart, they'll grow bigger. So this is exactly the same mix of mustard we saw in the last picture. Um, you, they'll go a little bit bigger and uh, you'll be able to harvest them for a bit longer because there's a bit more energy because they've got that much more space and that much more food. Uh, so you'll be able to harvest them over probably sort of a few weeks. Um, and also you get a nice pretty leaf shape. And you'll get a decent harvest as well off this, lots and lots of leaves. Um, finally, you can give them a spacing, the sort of full spacings that they like. And as they would, you, they probably give you on the, spe on, the, on the side of a seed packet about six inches between each plant. And mm -hmm. this way, you'll, they'll go and grow into a full size plant. And it'll take longer to harvest the plant. You know, it'll, it'll take longer to to get there, um, but you will be able to harvest the container over a much longer period of time, particularly if you're growing in winter. So a common time to sow mustards would be in, the, in probably early September, and you could probably keep these plants growing uh, all through the winter, picking leaves off them occasionally. Um, so there's no right or wrong way, but just different ways of growing, and actually it's quite fun to probably grow a mix of all different size leaves and the same thing applies to root veg so if you sow you wouldn't sow them really close like the first picture but you might sow them like an inch or two apart uh, and if very close you get very small roots and further apart you get bigger ones uh, and one thing you can do if you sow them quite close is you can do what's called thinning out so you can pull some of them out early to leave more space for the other ones uh, to grow bigger. Uh, fruiting plants uh, really do need um, a um, one plant in a pot. Um, so things like tomatoes, uh, it generally, um, you, in particular in a hanging basket like this, you would only put one plant because they need a lot of energy to produce all those fruits. And if you put lots of plants in there, uh, you, you certainly wouldn't get any more fruit, you'd probably get less. Um, this container above uh, has actually got, that's a lot bigger container, so that's got two tomatoes uh, in, it, um, in it there. Uh, so the next thing is to, step six, to establish a regular watering routine. And um, water is important for three things, really. Well, it obviously it's for really to keep plants alive but it's also very important for plant health so quite often I meet people who say they've got a very bad pest problem in their container garden and quite often the cause of that is that the plants have been given enough water to live but not quite enough water to thrive and when water plants don't have quite enough water to thrive they're much more prone to insect attack pest attacks um, Lack of water can also affect the taste. So salads in particular quite often get bitter if they haven't had enough water. Uh, and if compost dries out, it's very hard to re-wet it. So it's important for the compost as well. Um, the thing which, the most common thing that goes wrong 
and uh, mistake, easiest mistake to make is this is a tray of fava beans of microgreens. Now, when you sow these, um, they don't need very much water because it's just the seeds. But as they grow, they slowly need more and more water. And I know this sounds obvious, but it's easy to forget this. And if you turn this tray upside down, turn it out and look at the root network underneath, you'll see how many roots are there. And these plants are all drinking water. So they're just going to be using like loads more water when they were when they first sowed them. And so a lot of people grow microgreens and don't realise this. And then all their leaves grow tough and bitter. And it's because they haven't got enough water. And it's the same with things like potato plants. So small potatoes won't need much water. When they get big and bushy like this, they'll need a lot more. Uh, and the way to tell if plants need watering is to put your finger into the soil, a couple of inches down, and it should feel damp like a wrung out flannel. The surface isn't always a good indicator, so that's why it's important to put your finger in. Obviously, you can't do that with every pot every day, but do try and do it regularly to try and get a sense of when your plants need watering. And the secret really to successful watering is establishing a daily routine. Um, most plants and containers need watering uh, most days of, of, of the week and you know particularly if it's if it's hot or windy. Um, and it can be a really lovely way to start the day or end the day. Uh, I love it just pottering around the garden looking at what we're going to eat um, and if you see it in that way as a sort of mindful way rather than a chore um, it can be very enjoyable and it can be very quick I mean I have loads of pots so it does take me 20 minutes half an hour in the summer but a more sensible sized <laughs> or slightly smaller potato garden often may only take five or ten minutes um, to, to water. Uh, number seven is feeding plants um, they really do need feeding uh, if they're going to do well so this was an experiment I did where I used some old I got some old compost which had been used from last year and I planted some salad seedlings into them and I fed three of the containers and the, the black one here I just uh, watered it there's no feed in it um, these three containers the ones where plants are growing strongly were all fed with different uh, fertilizers um, and you can see it didn't make a massive difference which fertilizer I used but the ones which weren't fed at all hardly grew at all um, but it's also interesting that apart from hardly growing they, there wasn't they looked actually fine so if I hadn't actually been doing this test I might not have realized that the reason why they weren't growing was that they didn't have, have um, enough food so I mean this is a really big subject feeding plants but the most important thing really just to remember is that feeding them does make a difference. Um, and it's really useful if you can remember that plants uh, or learn that this thing about NPK, because this is on the side of all fertilizers you buy. Uh, N stands for nitrogen, P for phosphorus, K for potassium. And if you can remember the mnemonic shoots, roots and fruits, uh, nitrogen for leaf. So if you're growing leafy veg, you want to feed high in nitrogen. If you're growing a root veg, you want one in high in phosphorus. And if you're growing a fruiting veg, you want one high in uh, potassium. And actually, to really keep it simple, all you really need when you're in your container garden, if you're starting off, I mean, there's all sorts of things you can make, uh, fertilizers you can make, and I'll mention a few of those at the end. But actually, if you buy a bottle of tomato feed for all your fruiting veg, so that's runner beans, uh, even your apples, uh, chilies, all your fruiting stuff will benefit from tomato feed. And then if you get a bag of chicken manure pellets um, and then mix that into the soil when you replant it to grow anything leafy. And those two fertilizers will really go a long way uh, to helping you grow successfully. And the other one I would really recommend getting is seaweed, because as well as nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, plants, in the same way we do, need a wide range of uh, trace elements, minerals, and plants need those as well. And seaweed is full of these uh, trace elements and minerals. So uh, this is a really good way of giving the plants those minerals and helping them to grow strong and having all the things that they um, need and you just water that on 
Uh, put it a little bit in your watering can. You don't need very much. Water it on once a week. And the third thing plants need is soil life. So they need NPK, they need the minerals, and they need soil life. And there's various ways you can add that, but the way, and I talk about lots of them in my book, um, but one of the simplest ways is if you have space, get a wormery, um, because worm compost is absolutely full of life uh, and is fantastic for your crops. I will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but I'm just showing you this photograph again to show you that actually it didn't really matter what I fed them with, but feeding them made a big, big difference. And the last one is just to keep learning. <laughs> keep trying it. <laughs> Did you and... make chocolate on the table? <laughs> right. Okay. So, what to grow? I thought someone was shouting at me for a second. Well, I thought I wasn't sure what was going on. Okay. Uh, what to what to grow? Um. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some things to grow. Um. Microgreens are brilliant because they don't need a lot of sun, they grow quickly, and they you get a very high yield from a small space. One I really recommend is pea shoots, um, because you can grow these from, they're delicious, and you can grow them from dried peas from a supermarket. I'm sure many of you have already tried this, uh, and you can just find some old trays from a fruit market or something. Um, but you can basically grow a gourmet crop in a small space quickly and easily. Uh, and there's loads of different microgreens you can grow. So you can basically, uh, these are sunflower shoots, nasturtium, uh, this is auric, a mixed mustards, more peas there. And so it just in a very small space, you can grow a wide variety of leaves and the most delicious uh, salads. And um, herbs are really great. Um, so the one drawback of microgreens is you have to keep sowing them um, regularly. And that's fine as long as you like sowing, but it, it is more uh, I'd recommend you do it. But the big thing about herbs is that you just plant them and you leave them and they will give you a constant hit of flavour pretty much throughout the year. I mean, most of these herbs you can see in this picture can actually be picked uh, all year round, albeit only sort of tentatively in winter, they can be picked uh, the tarragon actually in the uh, lemon verbena die back um but these are great because um yeah they're actually pretty easy uh, to grow the key really for the herbs is just to repot them every one or two years ideally if you have space in a little bit larger pot if you can but that's not essential but it is really does make a difference to repot them and if they're big to divide them and the other thing is feeding liquid seaweed uh, once a week or once a fortnight uh, while they um, are growing. But they're lovely things to have on your doorstep. Uh, I also, so that's the back of my house is the front. If you have a lucky, like, make a ladder or something, you can grow a lot of herbs um, in that sort of uh, space. And it's brilliant to be able to go outside and pick them. These are all, these, none of these are difficult to grow um, and they don't need a lot of sun. And this is a windowsill herb garden. So even in a, like just a windowsill. Uh, so this was in a flat I had and we could pick these herbs, have herbs nearly with every meal just from these three pots. Uh, salads are really good. Um, and, you know, grow a few microgreens, a few leaves, a few edible flowers, and you can eat salads like this every day. Uh, just so completely different from anything you can buy. Uh, so this is a supermarket crate, same with rockets. So this is like really what I was showing you before with this, the spacings. So I'd call these baby leaves. So these are not sown far enough apart to grow into strong, big plants, but they've, they've, got, they've got enough space to develop into proper leaf shape. And you get a really good harvest uh, off that sort of tray. Uh, nasturtiums, I think, are just fantastic uh, for so many reasons, edible flowers edible leaves, edible seed pods, uh, and they look really beautiful. So um, and the leaves look really lovely in salads as well. So I always grow a few of those. This is a, one of my favorite edible flowers. It's called Dulbagia fairy star. It flowers all the way from April to November. And these flowers taste like garlic. 
Uh, leafy veg is good in containers. Uh, charred bright lights is good because it's very pretty uh, and it tastes good, as is kale. Uh, and fruit um, is, is also excellent. The thing about fruit is you do need to be a bit more patient because it does take time to establish. Uh, but you can get very high yields. I already mentioned that we get about 100 apples off this tree, but it is 10 years old. Uh, and we did produce some, you know, after two or three years, 10, 20 apples, but it's only probably been producing 100 for the last two or three years. But that is enough apples, really, for us all to um, have an apple every day while it's... Uh, um, but the key thing with growing fruit is the variety and the rootstock. And it's, I really recommend that you go to a professional fruit nursery because it's a really complicated area and it's really good to get a professional um, advice uh, on it. Uh, and the other thing, as I mentioned, is patience. Uh, so for, just to give you an example of variety, why it's important. So this is a raspberry, but this particular variety is called Glencoe. And it's a purple raspberry. But the great thing about this raspberry is it fruits on this year's canes, which means that um, but most summer raspberries, you have to have two sets of canes. You have to have last year's and this year's. And the, um, the actual fruit comes on last year's canes. And that's quite difficult and quite fiddly. And it takes up a lot of space in the container. But this one fruits on this year's uh, stems, uh, which makes it uh, much more suitable and it's very productive and it's lovely to have purple raspberries on your doorstep. Uh, and rhubarb <laughs> is really great. And that, I put that in because that's, uh, that's growing at the moment and looking like, it actually this is from a couple of years ago, but it's looking like that at the moment. And it's lovely being able to go out this time of year and pick rhubarb. Uh, lots of veg do well. Just going to mention a couple of things. Runner beans are great because they look brilliant and uh, and French beans as well, actually. They look brilliant and they're incredibly productive. So I grow these in most supermarket veg crates. We saw the rocket in a minute ago and you can get at least five kilos of beans off one crate. This is one picking. So I have this is from one crate of, of runner beans and one crate of French beans. Tomatoes are very good. And if you like chilies and you've got a sunny space, uh, you can pretty much be self-sufficient in chilies because you can dry and freeze them. So they are brilliant. Right. I'm just about to finish. Uh, just a couple more minutes. Nearly 40, uh, 40 minutes. So what we've got three more minutes. Then. <laughs> just give you some top tips for healthy, abundant crops. And my top one really is to start a wormery. Um, wormeries are fantastic because not only are you, well, you're recycling your waste food, uh, but you're creating a compost which is extremely rich in microbial life and much richer than normal compost, which the plants absolutely love. Now, it's quite easy to create worm comp good worm compost with just your kitchen waste and some cardboard. But if you're really into growing, um, then there are some ingredients you can add into your compost which can transform form it and make it into like a really incredible growing media. Um, Well-rotted manure is one of them. The worms absolutely love that. Uh, composted wood chip is extremely good. You can buy from Melcourt in bags uh, composted bark. And that's very good because what it does is uh, it adds a wood source to the compost, but it also adds structure to it. So it adds more air holes and gaps in it. So it becomes much better to use and add into your mix. Uh, if you can find nettles or comfrey, they speed up the wormery and the worms love it and it works really well. Uh, there's a product called Brock Dust you can buy, which often is not that, doesn't do that much, but when it's mixed with very uh, microbially active things, it can uh, be very effective because the, the nutrients are released by the microbes. Um, and if you go for a walk in a wood, and it's a big wood and it doesn't feel like you're going to damage it in any way. <laughs> then just picking up a bit of scrapings from the floor, the forest floor, um, there's going to be billions of wonderful different microbes in that. And if you pick that up and add it into your wormery, you'll be sort of like inoculating it with, uh, with life. 
And so, yes, that can help you uh, create fantastic worm compost. And then you can use it lots of different ways. One of the ways I do is I mulch. My tomatoes mulching means putting a layer of it around the top of the tomatoes and it just helps them grow really strong. But there's loads of other uh, fertilizers you can make at home if you want to. As I said, you know, if you're living in the middle of a city and you're busy, actually to start off with, I don't want to make you feel you have to do any of this because um, actually you can just go and buy a bottle of tomato feed and it will work perfectly well. But if you have the time and the interest, then you can make all sorts of things. And there are ways to make comfrey um, liquid, which don't smell, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, so comfrey is well known by gardeners, but when you mix it with water in the traditional way and let it soak, it stinks to high heaven. And if you're in a flat, it really is the last thing that you really want uh, near you. And I'll show you in a second how you do that. Um, but there's lots of other ways you can make, you can make uh, um, fertilizer by soaking mussels in vinegar, um, which is very good because that's going to be high in calcium. You can make it with nettles, you can make it with bones. Uh, they need to be roasted in the oven first and then soaked in vinegar. Um, but look, all these are waste products which you can make very good, or eggshells, very good fertilizer out of. So this is the comfrey. Basically, what you do here is you mix, chop up comfrey and mix it with an equal weight of sugar, brown sugar, uh, mix them all together, pack it down into a jar, put a thin layer of sugar over the top and leave it. And literally three or four days later, all this liquid will be released. It ferments. And after a week, you have a sweet smelling, delicious smelling liquid uh, which is full of all the goodness of the comfrey and it doesn't smell, well, it doesn't smell bad. <laughs> so it's a really great uh, one. And if you're interested in all this thing, there's a book by Nigel Palmer, actually, uh, which I highly recommend. And one way of applying this in the garden, well, two ways. One is to dilute it with water in a watering can and water it onto the soil. The other, which is very, very effective with all these liquid seaweed and all those liquids I just showed you, is to apply to the foliar feed. In a, this is a big sprayer, but you can just use an old kitchen cleaning bottle, just well cleaned out. Spray it on the leaves, and the plants can absorb the nutrients through the leaves. And they seem to really like that because they need the nutrients in the leaves. So when you spray it on the leaves, they don't have to transport it from the from the roots up. Um, so those are just a couple of tips for abundance and. I'm aware that I have got to end my time. So yes, there's a web, I have a website, Vertical Veg. And if you want seasonal tips, uh, you can sign up for those there on Facebook as well. And as uh, Linda mentioned, there's a book, which is about 300 pages long. So hopefully it's a fairly comprehensive guide to uh, growing in containers.